This is the Malvi Research Program. As Sky said, we got started in 1983. There was some money floating around the state land department budgets that had to be expended before the end of the calendar year. So me, John Madsen, and a student from England who happened to be visiting in Tucson at the time came up and pot hunted a couple of rooms <laughs> at Amalvi <all> too. <laughs> and then we came back in the spring of 1984 and excavated the rooms that we'll see maps of and you'll see tomorrow if you go on the tour that got this all started. So here we are in Winslow and the Homolvy site group is just outside of town here scattered up the river a little ways farther from where we are and there are clearly relationships to the Hopi Mesas which are just about 60 miles north of us. Um, there's also an outlier to Hopi um, that many of you probably know about out around Tuba City, Moenkopi. Um, and you can see they're all equidistant from the Flagstaff area, which is important because the San Francisco peaks are very important to the Hopi in terms of where the Kachinas live and where they go back and forth to. Um, we were talking a little bit about um, the landscape at dinner, and one thing to notice is these three major drainages coming off the Hopi mesas all collect into a common one and get into the river just above Loop. And right at Loop, there are some tremendously large um, pit house villages that are larger than the ones here in the park. Um, most of our ceramics from Homolavi um, come from around the countryside, but they certainly always indicate connections back to the north somewhere. And this may be one way that people got to Homolavi by coming down the washes first and then working their way back up the river. <clears throat> the name for this area um, in Hopi is Homolavi. Whenever you see OVI on the end of a word, it means place of. So this is the place of the little mounds and buttes, which kind of describes the landscape around the neighborhood here. Once upon a time, there were supposedly somewhere between 20 and 40 little buttes and mesas inside Winslow, but they all got dismantled for things like foundations under the Hubble building, <laughs> except for that little one that's right over there. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, we started this <laughs> in 1983 and when we came back finally after the 1984 season and really started the work seriously in 91 we couldn't even find the rooms that we'd excavated in so we didn't know but these were the five rooms that we did in the spring of 84 we had great help from the ARC societies of the state AAS and ARC and HIST from Tucson helped immensely we even had a few school kids from Winslow come out with Honey Hansen and her classes. And these rooms got stabilized right away. Um, it was a way to potentially showcase the site um, before it was turned into a state park that if any of the legislators got busy and wanted to see this for themselves, it would look like something real as opposed to just a pile of rocks. So those five rooms were opened up. And I want to point out one thing here. Notice there's a doorway right here. There was a partially filled doorway over here, and there's the edge of a doorway right here. And in some of the southwestern literature, there was an awful lot made of the fact that these pueblos never had exterior entries. But in point of fact, they did have exterior entries, at least in the initial construction. It was from the work in 1984 that we recovered this piece of a bowl that has a sun forehead kachina on it, um, according to our Hopi contacts. And they are, in fact, one of the major clans that ended up at Second Mesa primarily, but certainly a clan that claims its inheritance and descendants from here. Our first graduate student was Kelly Hayes Gilpin, who is now a curator over at Museum of Northern Arizona and NAU. She's also a bit of an artist, and she rendered this thing. 
that turned into our unofficial project logo that occurs all over t-shirts and hats and occasional sweatshirts and things like that. And wouldn't you know, 30 years later, Kelly Hayes Gilpin, working at M&A, was reviewing their type collections. And she found a shirt that had been collected in 1981 from the surface. And it fits right there. So we now know that there's actually another set of three lines over here. And the eyelashes for the kachina actually come all the way out to the rough. But it's an amazing eye to be able to put that piece together. She mailed it down to the State Museum and we glued it in there. So it's now in the exhibit down there. But why, why we keep collections and why they're important to go through every now and then. So this is what we know as the Hamalvi Settlement Cluster. There's actually one site missing here. Um, it's Jackrabbit Ruin that's located about over here on the north side of the interstate, almost right across from the Jackrabbit modern day trading post where you can go and ride the rabbit. If you all haven't done that, you should do that. Make Amy take you there. <laughs> um, Hamalvi 1, 2, 3, 4 were numbered by Jesse Walter Fuchs in the 1890s. He had been up at Hopi and was pursuing oral traditions of various clans who kept talking about a place called Homolovy. And they probably thought they were going to find one site, but when they came down, they discovered four and he just numbered them one, two, three, four. So the one, two, three, four has nothing to do with the order in which they were occupied though. So don't use that as a reference point. So there are these villages um, and jackrabbit that are all part of an occupation that really takes off in the late 1200s and lasts up until about 1400 or so. Um, initially from Fuchs's work he excavated primarily at Hamalvi 3, he did a little bit of work at H2 and H1 and a little bit more at Chevlon, but the feeling was kind of that they were totally contemporaneous. And as we got into them, the first major excavations were at three, which is nothing like the little bit of work we'd done at two. Moved over to four, it was nothing like three. <laughs> Moved back to two, it was nothing like three or four, and one was even totally different. And so they all kind of have very different, almost unique histories. In conjunction with the excavation program, I ran the survey for four years and we surveyed about 25 square miles. That means we lined up our volunteers and systematically walked the landscape. And so in addition to the seven sites of the Homolovy cluster, we know of now about 400 other sites that are out there on the landscape. Most of them are just simple scatters and sort of indicate places um, where people were farming or if it's on a gravel terrace where they were selecting cobbles and things to make stone tools and get flake material out of, those sorts of things. Um, it also, in putting the report together for the survey, became very obvious that this location along the Little Colorado River, which is the main thing flowing through here, um, is not... <laughs> just purely fortuitous or random. It heads up down here in the White Mountains around Springerville, and like many rivers in Arizona, which is really bizarre for North America, it actually flows north. Most rivers in North America flow south. But down in southeastern Arizona and up here on the plateau, here's one that flows north and it drops into the Grand Canyon just below Cameron. But immediately upstream, from the Homolovy area, or downtown Homolovy, are three very important drainages, Jack's Canyon, Clear Creek, and Chevlon Creek. And looking at stream gauge information, in fact, most of the flow in the Little Colorado River that eventually goes over Chocolate Falls down here um, actually comes out of the Chevlon drainage. Not that much water gets into the system. If you want a comparison, look when you go across the highway bridge here in Winslow and go across the bridge in Holbrook and you can see the difference in the scale of floodplain just in that amount of distance. 
So these guys knew exactly where they were parking themselves. They got themselves right where there was a phenomenal amount of water. They also hit an interesting geological area where they just had to look at their maps and they saw green and they knew they could grow things there. No, sorry. <coughs> Each of these guys is about a mile on a side, so there are parts of the floodplain here that are over two and a half miles wide. The problem is getting too much water sometimes that you can't control. So looking at our history more carefully, we see that people were here when it's dry everywhere else, which is a natural reaction to come where there's water still flowing. But if it's kind of normal or above normal, they tend to disappear to other places on the landscape and get away from the floods that happen on here because it would just totally take out anything you tried to plant in the crops. We saw this for ourselves in 1993 and again in 1995, almost back to back, we had 500 year floods. One of them almost turned Hamalavi 1, which is on this mound, into an island. It also exposed a lot of adobe brick architecture just here behind the fence that we had sort of known about but didn't realize the scale of until the waters receded and all the adobe brick walls started popping out very clearly. So that was kind of cool. Down below the visitor center are these two buttes in a place we call Ho Valley because of some funny little notched artifacts we found out there. And it looked like a veritable ocean with waves and white caps and all that good stuff wow. during those floods. But it's only about six inches deep, so <laughs> don't get too excited. But it was very instructive. Also along the river are other natural resources, the cobble terraces and things I kind of mentioned before. But there is abundant lithic material available, quartzites and cherts, sometimes a little petrified wood. Um, just right there for the testing, and people have in fact been doing that for millennia. They're also primarily on the other side of the river from here. The southwest winds scour across the floodplain and pick up all the sediment and deposit it as big sand dunes over on the east side of the river, north and east side of the river. And it's this kind of environment and the little hollows that show up in the dunes that are just ideal for dry farming. And the Hopi had corn and other crops really well adapted to being planted deep into the winter moisture and surviving until the monsoons show up about this time of year or a little bit after. Based on the ceramics that are here, because we have very little pre-ceramic occupation right in the park area, we've got a lot more in the area at Rock Art Ranch where we worked from about 2010 to 2016 where there's all kinds of paleo and archaic stuff. and It's only 20 miles away from here. But in the park area itself, very little paleo and archaic material, mostly ceramic period. So based on the ceramic design styles, we defined a series of phases. And you can see the date ranges assigned to that. Um, but don't take that as meaning that during the Leno phase, people were actually living here solidly for 160 years. From the climatic reconstructions, we can see that there are kind of six-year mini-cycles in what's going on. And out of those time, out of that six years, one or two years might be good, two years are going to be bad, and two other years are kind of so-so. So they were very well attuned to that. And when things got either too wet or were not being productive on the river here, they were gone. So a lot of the pit house villages and things like that have houses and structures that are probably only occupied for you know, even less than a generation at times. And they're coming back and forth and moving in and out. It's not until partway through this Tuiuka phase at the end of the 1200s that we get significant population actually parking themselves on the landscape and then living here from about 1280 to nearly 1400. And those populations are actually staying here the whole time. But these other phases, people are kind of in and out and moving around. They occupy a lot of the same geographical, topographical places time after time. 
The yellow doesn't show up real well here, but the pit house villages are on the ridges often or higher mesas away from the edge of the floodplain. And the artifact scatters that are around them are either areas where they're procuring things like stone material or they're actually doing their farming and stuff. And the occupation distribution doesn't really change all that much um, through the early and middle phases. This is a pottery type called Lino Black on Gray that goes with the Lino phase. It's a pottery type that was made up in the Hopi Mesas area and brought or traded down here to Homolavi. This is the succeeding pottery type called Kana'a Black on White um, that is indicative of what we call a Pueblo I period, more in the eight and nine hundreds. Um, a little better finish on the pottery and some thin line work. These guys, and through the first half of the middle period, are living in these big circular pit houses. This stick on the floor of the pit house looking down from above is about a yard, a meter in length, so it's about four to five meters across. Some of them have ramp entryways, others were just entered straight through the roof in the smoke hole. In schematic form, they kind of look like this. There's a four post pattern um, with framing over the top and then things leaned up against the side. These are really pretty shallow pit houses for the most part. And again, some of them have an entryway out to the side. Others, they just put the ladder right down the smoke hole and go in and out that way, sort of like a kiva is in some ways. We also see patterned um, pit house villages where there are little courtyard groups. Um, often one or two houses are the habitation and then the other one or two houses are purely storage, meaning that they rarely have hearths and things in them that show habitation. And then quite often there's a much larger community structure. There's one of these at the pit house village right out behind the visitor center. Um, that one, though, we don't think was ever roofed, probably. It was just a big basin, and interestingly, it had been um, positioned right over the top of a much earlier pit house. <clears throat> we get into the middle period. There's a little more extensive use of the landscape area, but again, primarily focused along the edge of the floodplain. There's an interesting series of sites up here Actually, those should have been plotted on the early um, map as well. But the fickle nature of where the main stream channel for the Little Colorado is, if we had done this survey now, we would never see these sites. Because the river, because of the dike work that's being done down here with the levees, has changed its pattern and has now scoured this whole area and totally taken those sites out. So it was just pure luck that we surveyed when we surveyed. This is the pottery type that goes with the early part of the middle um, phase, middle period, called Black Mesa, black and white. It too is a pottery type like the previous two that comes down from the Hopi Mesa country. When we get into the second half of the middle period though, the walnut phase, we get a brand new pottery type called walnut, black and white. And instead of being made up at Hopi, this stuff is being made a little bit closer just up here in the Hopi Buttes area. And we know that because the clay involved in making this pottery comes out of the Bidahochi Formation, which is what outcrops right there around the Hopi Buttes and over in the eastern Hopi Buttes a little bit more at a place called Bidahochi, surprisingly enough. When we get into the later part of the middle period, suddenly the housing changes. Instead of the big circular pit houses, here's a much smaller rectangular pit house. And what they also do is move the storage out of the individual structures and start having accompanying above ground um, structures for storage. And that's kind of the start of what happens to make early Pueblos, as they eventually totally move out of pit houses to above ground room blocks and pueblos. When we move into the late period, you can see again they're occupying areas right along in and at the edge of the floodplain, but many of the activity areas 
in the area that we surveyed are much more related to this late period of stuff, which means generally they have Hopi yellow pottery on them. So making a very extensive use. For a while in the mid to late 1200s, there's a local pottery type. It's called Winslow Orangeware. This is a type actually called um, Homolovy Polychrome. It bears a lot of resemblance to White Mountain Redware from southeast of here. It also has some similarities to things from the Kayenta country up to the north of here. So we're not quite sure what the source of the inspiration for this stuff is. But once they started getting Genito yellowware, they gave up on this, probably because the wood was so valuable for fire and heat and cooking wood that they didn't have enough wood left over for making pottery, and it was just as easy to trade cotton from here for pottery. So this is Homolovy 4. This, in fact, is the earliest of the Homolovy sites. It was occupied about 1260 and abandoned which is not a good word, discontinued in use <clears throat> by about 1280 or so. And we don't know whether these guys then moved a little ways away to Homolovy 3 or whether they went totally somewhere else. There is a very similar site to this one um, just south of Second Mesa. You notice the little volcanic plug that's sticking up, a little butte called Hoyapi, where the Hopi gather eagles but it ceramically and architecturally matches this one almost perfectly, right up there at Second Mesa. This is Doug Gann's reconstruction of what it would have looked like. And interestingly, also, it seems to have been built from the top down. This is right on the edge of the floodplain. They certainly could have had floods around here. <clears throat> Homolovy 3 is right in the floodplain, and this is the smallest of the Homolovy sites by far, only about 40 to 50 rooms. And notice the long linear nature of this and two rooms wide. And in fact, the back rooms were added on a little bit later um, in the first set of rooms that did get remodeled at some point. But instead of a front-to-back relationship of a habitation room and a storage room behind it, they tend to be habitation room, storage room, habitation room, storage room, alternating as you go down the row. <clears throat> this was first built in about 1280 um, at a point in time in the middle of the great drought of the Southwest that runs in especially in the Four Corners area from about 1277 to 1299 or so. And by 1300, the water came back and the floods came back. And these guys being parked right on the floodplain, this was not a good place to live anymore. So they disappeared. There is a great kiva there. There is also a bit of a ceramic signature that suggests that there's some more influences at Humalvi 3 from the south and east. So back to this map, we've now looked at Humalvi 4 and 3. Humalvi 4 is the earliest, 1260, 1280. Humalvi 3, about 1280 to 1300. Also found at about 1280, though, are Humalvi 1 and Chevlon Ruin. These other guys, Cottonwood, Humalvi 2, and Jackrabbit all come in later in the 13. 1300s. <clears throat> so again, this occupation with H4 getting started at 1260, a lot of the other villages coming in in the middle of this, and it's about 1325, 1330 when we start getting yellow pottery down from the Hopi mesas, and that's what sets off the homology phase at the end. At Homolovy 1, where we excavated from about 1994 through 98 or so, um, this became an interesting case study in that suddenly it became very obvious that this north part of the Pueblo was the original construction. It sits on the higher little bump along the edge of the river, and the river is right there. Um, there were Early on in the construction of this, no interior courtyards or plazas. 
It was just a giant mass of rooms. Interestingly, at some point in the mid-1300s, they add on this big plaza on the south end. And there is a little bit of late adobe architecture, adobe brick architecture up in here, but most of this addition is all adobe brick architecture. And if you look in the southwestern literature hard enough, you'll see statements, <laughs> silly statements like, there were no adobe bricks until the Spanish got here and showed the poor Indians how to make them. Um, if we'd read in our own literature, if you go farther up the little Colorado, there are in fact all kinds of adobe brick stuff even earlier than the Homolavi site. So it was a well-known technology. But what we don't know now is whether this was added on because of Homolavi II arriving in the landscape or was just something happening regionally. At the time they add that plaza on the south end, they also dismantle parts of room blocks up in the north part of the Pueblo, the old part of the Pueblo, and take off the upper stories and fill in with trash the lower stories and turn them into open communal public spaces. So a big push to plaza orientation. Now we kind of talked about this with the doorways in the one picture. The way most people envision you get in and out of these things is on the plaza side. You climb up a ladder to the roof and then you drop down a ladder. And once you're inside the building, then you can go through doorways into other rooms or up ladders to other rooms, but no ground floor sort of entries. So very unlike something like Pueblo Benito, where you can stand in the doorway and look from one end of the building to the other. Very different use of space and access to space. So very important the way this plaza was added on and the change in use of space. And we see that again at Chevlon Pueblo. The early part of the Pueblo is this mass of rooms up here. Very late in its occupation, they add on this huge plaza on the south side. As you can see from all the red stuff, the thing that's interesting about Chevlon Pueblo is a tremendous amount of the Pueblo was burned when it was abandoned. And we don't see that except in kivas at the other sites. So very interesting. This is from Olive II, and right away you can recognize the very large plazas. This was planned and built from the very beginning to have these giant open spaces in it. And we'll talk about how this thing came into existence here a bit. It's a very important location on the landscape. It's surrounded by rock art, uh, a lot of which right around Homalvi II features Kachina, Kachina iconography. Um, the only other of the Homalvi sites that has much in the way of iconography like that is Cottonwood ruin. Some of it's related to the fact that places like H1 and Chevlon don't have good sandstone blocks or bluffs right under them or near them. So it's impossible to make that rock art. But there's also shrines and other things that cluster around Homolvi too that make it a little bit different. So we see Kachina iconography in the rock art. We see it certainly from Homolvi too in the pottery that's there even though that pottery is not being made there. And we see other ritual signatures of things going on. There's a really good dissertation in progress right now from one of our graduate students, Sam Flad, who's talking in great depth and detail about the deposits at Homolvi I and comparing them both to H2 and Chevlon. But for instance, in one room, we have three rabbits that were very purposefully buried. They have all their little toes and toenails, so they've not been butchered for eating or anything. They were specifically put there. And three of them surround one ax and part of a loom block and another ax. All these three are on their right side. At Chevlon Pueblo, we have another room with three rabbits in it also, but those are all on their left sides. Who knows what that means? Also at Homolvi II, an indication of some of the things that people were attending to, ritual planting cycles and planting cycles and things. The Hopi elders tell this with 
this was probably the Sun Kachina, the Sun Watchers Kiva. And you can see how it resembles the skyline over toward the San Francisco peaks. Here's the high part with three little bumps. Here are three little bumps over on the San Francisco mountains, and it tails off to a little bump out here on the end. And there's the little bump out on the end. And to time things, the sun watcher would move a shirt or a rock or a stick along the floor, um, coinciding with where the sun happened to be setting against the peaks. <clears throat> so the floodplain and the occupation that's here and what was facing Homolavi II um, that was maybe not facing the other villages that were founded here. We can draw X's through these guys because at the time the real construction got started here about 1280, Homolavi IV was already abandoned, Homolavi II didn't exist yet. So there's only Homolavi III and Homolavi I. And looking at Hopi land tenure, what they were probably doing is divvying up the floodplain. And a little bit upstream and a little bit downstream would have been the primary areas that those villages controlled for their farming. At least what they were doing on the floodplain. Cotton, especially. Corn does not like to get its roots wet. So they're probably doing corn up in the sand dunes and cotton in the floodplain. But the story kind of of Homolavi II, I think, may revolve around driftwood. We saw from the floods in 93 and 95 um, what happens. And this is a driftwood pile that was just right beside Homolavi I Pueblo where we were working at the time, basically. And this leads to a quick discussion of climatic realities kind of along the little Colorado River. I said the great drought was 1277 to 1299. And a lot of these villages get going very early in that drought. And one thing that you would definitely need in this environment to build pueblos like that is construction materials to make the roofs out of. You're making the walls out of stone, but the roofs have to be wood. So unless you get a bounty of driftwood coming down that river, and this is probably what showed up, by the time they got done building Amalvi 3 and Amalvi 1, um, those of you who live in the Winslow area, might remember from these floods that between the old highway and the interstate, there was a huge pile of driftwood stacked up down there. And it was less than a year before all that wood was gone to people's barbecues or whatever else they did with it. But it's important and goes away very quickly when people start working on it. So 1300 comes along, the water comes back, Malvi 3 gets abandoned. And I'm guessing that these guys at Homolvi III probably went and joined up with Homolvi I. But the way Hopi land tenure works is they never, the families that made this move, never forgot about their claim and ownership of that area. We know from 1300 into the 1330s, it was kind of wet. So it may have been sort of tenuous, but they made it work. And then from about 1335 to 1355 or so, there were 20 really good years where the climatic conditions were fairly stable. And it was dryish, but I'm sure they were getting floods. And so it made farming really good on the floodplain. 1356 to 1359, they get some tremendously wet years that would have brought a whole new raft of driftwood down. And by that time, these families may have decided that this is a pretty cool gig growing cotton on the floodplain, and maybe we should go move somewhere else. And I make this argument somewhat on just pure logistics. Homolavi II, as big as it is, you would have to have a tremendous work party. There's no Motel 6. There's no Denny's. There's no Circle K for getting donuts and coffee. 
how in the hell do you feed these people? And how would anybody up at the Hopi Mesas know that the driftwood had arrived? And by the time they got organized to get down here, the guys at Humalavi One would have used all the driftwood. So I think it was a population that was already here and already had a claim on that land to say, we're going to split off. You guys keep your area of the floodplain and we're gonna reoccupy this mesa up here and reoccupy our part of the floodplain and just keep on growing. So I think we've got really strong evidence that the earliest homology two could have existed is sometime in the very late 1350s and was certainly there by about 1360 or so. Yellowware pottery and sourcing. We know that this matches clays up at the Hopi Mesas and it's the only place, excuse me, you can get clay like that to make yellow firing pottery. We unceremoniously drill a little powder off the bottom of the vessel, send it to the folks in Missouri, and sometimes they tell us where the pot was made. There's some <clears throat> new complications about this. There is a biography of Nampeo, the famous Hopi potter by the Blairs, and there's one little paragraph in there that is very disturbing. It says, one day she made a pot that they can document had five different clays in it, which is unusual because the standard is two clays. Now, if those two clays only come from a few feet apart in the exposure, that's probably not a big deal. But if one comes from First Mesa and another comes from Antelope Mesa, that's a problem. So at the moment, the more yellowware data that the folks at Murr have in their database the fuzzier it's getting rather than the clearer it's getting. So the initial um, signals are that most all of the yellowware pottery we get at Homolavi, any Homolavi site, comes from Antelope Mesa, probably either from a Wadavi or a Kwaika. The other thing that's neat about Jedido yellowware is it has exterior emblems or designs on it. We call these exterior design elements, or EDEs. And a couple of folks, Stephen LeBlanc, an archaeologist, and Lucia, or Lucia Henderson, an art history type person, wrote a book called Symbols in Clay, where they tried to map out the relationship of all these things. And they were looking at these as basically individual potter signatures. And if you track those around the landscape, you get some interesting distributions of things. So this shows you at a place like Awadavi, there are 35 pairs that are shared with some other village somewhere. So off of Antelope Mesa, the village of Awadavi, there are 11 match sets that go to somewhere at Homolavi. There are six that match to things at H1, four that match to things at H2, several matches to things over on Second Mesa as well as First Mesa, but kind of showing the loop potentially that particular designs are involved in. This is the distribution from Kwaika'a and also on Antelope Mesa. Little bit of relationship with First Mesa, pretty strong with Second Mesa, and some relatively good ties to general homology area as well as H1 and H2. <clears throat> At H1, we get pretty strong ties to Antelope Mesa in some fashion and slightly lesser to like Mishongavi or to Old Walpi on First Mesa. Homology 2 is very similar, but it's also kind of a little bit different. We get a little more emphasis on Antelope Mesa some more balanced relationship to First Mesa and Second Mesa. And look how many of these things are shared between H1 and 2. <laughs> look at Chevlon. They're hardly in touch with anybody. <clears throat> but if you tie me down and smear me with honey and try to get me to say what I think those exterior designs are, I don't think they have anything to do with signatures. 
In fact, I think they may be sort of random. And within um, Jedido Yellowware, this may turn out to be the best case we have of Southwestern ceramics that clearly shows that multiple artists were involved in producing one pot. That somebody who's doing the inside is different from the person doing the outside. There are good pots, very well executed. This one's a little bit out of round. It got warped maybe in the firing. I don't know. But the interior execution is very good. The exterior element is also very nice. Here's a Jedido Yellowware pot that's pretty good on the inside, but it's outside <laughs> leaves a little bit to be desired. That's like a sixth grader would do, or somebody who didn't really care what they were doing. And if we look across some in excess, close to 300 pots, from Hamalvi 1, Hamalvi 2, and Kwaika up at Antelope Mesa, a little over 45% of the pots are what you could artistically call poor, either on the inside or the outside or both. As being old or infirm, I think the other aspect of that is they are maybe trying to crank this stuff out so fast that they don't care. I mean, the yellowware as a ceramic by itself is a good ceramic. It will hold water and withstand getting kicked around by kids and dogs better than a lot of other pottery in the Southwest. But the designs that are being put on it, and it shows up in other vessel forms as well, not just bowls. This is a type called Sikyatki polychrome. It's distinguished by having red fill and there are times that I think that whoever started making Sikyaki polychrome around somewhere between about 1375 and 1385 was maybe a different group of people or a group of potters at one village or maybe two villages that decided to control what they're doing and design better and execute. But it doesn't mean all yellowware jars are good either because, as you can see from this one, <laughs> they didn't really care. And there are basically not too many other pottery types anywhere in the Southwest that have this poor nature of execution on them. You think of things in the White Mountain Redware series, Salado series, black and white wares out of the mountains, and they're really pretty good and pretty specific, which may suggest that there are specialists involved and those are the only people making them. But at the point in time, yellowware became a tradable commodity for obsidian and cotton and stuff. It was everybody who could put the paint on a pot and crank them out and fire them as fast as you could. And they really didn't care. Another temporal thing that happens is yellowware starts from its beginnings to have this thing called a banding line that runs around the top of the pot and quite often has a line break, which you don't see in too many of the other wares in the Southwest. It does show up other places. But this banding line starts dropping away farther and farther from the rim over time. So if you very carefully measure this distance, um, and do some statistical averaging. You can see these things drifting down and the later ones have a really low banding line or sometimes no banding line at all. And if you look really carefully at this pot, there's a funny little ding mark over here on the side. We can zoom into that. Um, when we started putting together our reconstructable pots, there were a few like this that were just totally obvious. And any of you that have had misguided childhoods with a BB gun knows what happens when the BB hits the window, right? You get a little conchoidal fracture. So we had some diligent students who went into the lab of tra 
traditional technology at the U of A and made some pots and discovered the only way of getting little pot marks like that is to hit it with a fairly pointed cobble. So these things are being purposely broken before they're left behind. From homology one, all the whole reconstructed pots or mostly reconstructed pots, over two thirds of them have intentional destruction like that on them. What at homology in the 1300s that they're doing this. At homology two, it's over 50% of the whole or reconstructed pots that have these deliberate impact points, dips, I call them, which is more PC than kill holes. <laughs> and interestingly, plotting out those that have dips and those that don't, this is so-called Kiva X from Hawaii V2. This was excavated by a guy who was quite a famous Western artist, Gordon Pond. And he liked to pot hunt occasionally in his spare time. He excavated at Homology 2. Kelly Hayes Gilpin got him out there um, as we started in the 1980s, and he couldn't even remember which plaza it was in. But we do know it was Homology 2, and he actually, to his credit, published an article that this figure comes from um, in American Antiquity, our trade journal. But we have never found another structure like this. There were 24 pots in this kiva. And if you look at the distribution of the pots with dips, deliberate impact points, the ones on the floor, with the exception of one, the blue one down here, all of these guys have deliberate impact points on them. The guys that were put into the corners later, above the bench, as a later offering and closing to the kiva, are not treated that way. So it's definitely a behavioral choice in terms of what they're doing. Okay, this is the old map of Hamal V2. And just point out a few things quickly. Notice how big some of the room blocks, how many rooms wide they are. And different versions of this map kind of show different openings here and there. And it occurred to me at some point that kachinas have to be able to get into the plazas to dance. So there's got to be a way in. <clears throat> and this map didn't totally show it. So we got really lucky. And good old Darlene Brinkerhoff, who's not here because of her toes, supposedly, <laughs> um, came up with me and Sam Flad and my wife and a couple of other volunteers. And two different marches, spring breaks, we got absolutely perfect weather in Winslow, which is unheard of. <laughs> and. This particular map, over two and a half days with the total station, we shot over 1,800 points. But we think we cleaned up the map considerably. There may, in fact, be a gap here, or it may just be single story construction. This corner is definitely closed, as opposed to being open. The modern sidewalk goes right through here, so it's a little hard to tell. <coughs> Park. <laughs> Oh well. Um, but there's probably a gap there, but I think there for sure is a corridor over here on this side, and we'll take a look at that in the morning when we're over there. There may or may not be a gap up in there. But we redid a lot of the mapping and discovered where there was one and two stories. <clears throat> this kind of tracks the areas that we actually excavated in. These are the five rooms that we did in 84. We did two kivas and some plaza testing over here in the West Plaza. We did three kivas and some additional testing <clears throat> in the Central Plaza. We dug a set of rooms, some one story, some two story, across the south room block of the Central Plaza, as well as some extramural areas out here. It looks like all along the outside of this pueblo was a giant porch or Ramada area that was resurfaced time after time. And if you live in this part of the world, you realize that all the dominant winds come from the south and west <laughs> blowing in here. This is a great place to get out of the wind. And with a two-story construction, it'd be a great shade in the afternoon. We also excavated a kiva and a couple of half rooms over in the east plaza, some extra mural areas 
and another set of rooms running across the room block in the north room block there. <coughs> One thing that showed up in our mapping is that down here in the Ramada area, um, this was not just one massive giant room block that all went in at one time. There's some remodeling in here. There were foundation stones, not quite in the alignment of what the final room block was. There's another isolated structure out here. So that and some stuff that we picked up when we were mapping, which, what did I do with that picture? There it is. Ah, it's right in front of me. Over here in this part of the plaza, the room blocks, there are some walls that are totally aligned different from the way the room blocks are. So I think there's a good possibility there may have been an earlier, smaller Pueblo here for a while, and maybe that was just the temporary housing while they really got things lined up and built it. I don't know, but something somebody can go back and poke some more holes in and see how it really goes. This thing went up very quickly if it was not started until 1360. It only survived until sometime in the 1390s. So all these 1,100 rooms went up in 30 years. And they really built some and they abandoned the some. Other things, do you think? I think they were dealing with fluctuating population okay. that they were trying to house and a little bit of reorganization of space. Recognize the two room wide thing, just like Homology 3. And based on Hopi tradition of where you build, this is kind of the highest part um, of the ridge top. And so they started from there and built out. You'll see in a lot of literature, people talk about ladder construction, where they think they built the long parallel walls first and then subdivided it, kind of like rungs on a ladder. And these, excuse me, probably went together about like that, except the other march, when we weren't mapping, we came up and we re-excavated all the rooms that we had done before. Because I didn't believe the bonding, abutting relationships of the walls and corners that had been recorded in the field notes, because they weren't making sense. So when we looked at those in more detail, Somebody had the authority to say, thou shalt build a straight line of rooms. But within that, there are little groups of four to six rooms that were constructed as subsets of the construction. The initial construction looks like it was all single story. Very quickly, in some order, they added a second story to that, and then eventually added a couple of rooms out in front. And then they went really crazy, and maybe about the same time the first story got done here, they extended out this way to make what turned into the East Plaza. Interestingly, this only ever got to a single story. And it looks like pretty early in the Mall V2 life that they actually abandoned these rooms, maybe because this plaza that was defined was just way too big. And somebody said, no, 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 no. <laughs> but if you count up the rooms over here, and these room blocks anywhere around the West Plaza or around the Central Plaza could have easily absorbed the population coming from those if they had to reorganize where they were. <clears throat> the first set of rooms that went up kind of looked like this. And in fact, there were ground level doorways. So, ha, Chuck who says there are no such thing as exterior doorways in Pueblos. Ta-da, they're there. And they survive even in some of the latest additions in the West Plaza. It gets tricky, though, when they start adding on two rooms in front. In fact, a lot of these original doorways back here get sealed off. And many of these rooms back in behind are essentially abandoned or maybe they build a second story over the top of them and a lot of these rooms in the original lower story get used as trash dumps and stuff. But 1,100 rooms then is kind of a funny number because it doesn't reflect the fact that the East Plaza got abandoned 
and it doesn't reflect that up to maybe half the rooms at any one time were no longer in use even. So it's big, but not quite as big at one time as we thought it was. So at some point, and interestingly, if you looked at our excavations, we excavated here and here and here and over here. We didn't do anything in the north-south room blocks. So we don't really know as well how these things grew or what order they came in. But at some point after this had been abandoned, these room blocks get added. And then it's pretty clear that these two room blocks along the south edge are the latest additions to the Pueblo. <clears throat> and so it looks like this when they first start building it up. Just two rooms wide, very quickly parts of it goes to two stories. They eventually then add along the outside. Part of it only stays single story and part of it just butts right up against the porch areas on the outside. And this is kind of the final footprint of Hamal V2, not the three plaza thing that you typically see in the maps. If you were to stand this up, rotate it 90 degrees, looks an awful lot like Hamal V1 and Chevron Pueblo then, with two Pueblos, two plazas. And some people would get hold of that and go, oh, it's the old Pueblo dualism of bifurcated stuff like at Pueblo Benito, where there's a big wall that goes right down the middle, and you've got one side and the other side. Who knows? One of the other things that sets Homology 2 apart is several instances of human remains. This kiva is in the west plaza. This kiva is in the central plaza. In the West Plaza, we got very excited when we started finding the outlines of this kiva and what seemed to be a very heavy clay roof layer. <laughs> the surprise was when we got through the clay of the supposed roof layer, number one, there was no wood, which is unusual because we did get pretty good preservation at Hamal V2. And we started finding really big rocks and then humans. And these are not formal burials. This is a young man, um, young mid-teens. This is an unknown gender young child. This is a young woman in her 20s, probably. It's interesting to speculate this is a young man in his 20s, whether this was related as some family unit thing. What this probably is, is what's called witchcraft. Um, for lack of a better term, in the Southwest, that there's a classic study that was done um, by Clyde Cluckhone from Harvard about Navajo witchcraft, but a lot of things that he talks about in there are very applicable to this situation as well. And witchcraft is not something that's unique to the Southwest and the Native Americans in the Southwest. Parts of my family were on the receiving end at Salem. And he came, the husband came to the rescue of the wife who had been accused by one of the young children. And she was pregnant at the time and somehow in the midst of the hysteria they felt that the child had a chance to be saved. So they didn't off her right away, but in protecting her, he got squished under a big rock, and a couple years later, it all passed over. And if we think in our own culture of the kinds of offenses that generate the ultimate sanction of killing somebody, executing somebody, it's a much higher standard than what happens typically in witchcraft. Witchcraft can be reactions to jealousy and somebody who's getting stuff and not sharing it with the rest of the family or other personal relationships and odd things where that's one of the gossip controls in small communities anywhere in the world that if somebody doesn't get the point, <laughs> 
initially by people sort of spreading rumors behind their back and shut up and change their behavior. This is what happens to them. And no one, none of the other sites, there was one room at Chevlon that might have had an individual like this in it. They were sort of scattered, um, whereas these are clearly not scattered. Um, but it was so disturbed prehistorically that it was really hard to tell um, what that was. But it was another female, fairly adult sort of female, which often tend to be the recipient of things like this. But it's a very tricky and difficult sort of thing. I mean, these kivas are right in the middles of the plaza. They're not something that the community was trying to hide from the rest of the community. You can easily envision this as being done as a great morality play and lesson to those in the community that whatever these guys did, you don't want to be doing that because this is how you end up. And to sacrifice a structure right in the middle of the living community is something very foreign kind of to our way of thinking that way. If we have troublemakers, we think of these great exotic things you do in Western films where you drive somebody out to the desert and run them off. Well, the problem with that is they find friends and come back and cause trouble. So the easiest way to deal with somebody who's not behaving appropriately is make them an example and just flat off them and get rid of that problem. This kiva was burned. This poor guy had arrow points in a couple of fleshy parts of his body. Um, like he had been chased into the kiva and then they kind of burned it down. His head was up the ventilator shaft trying to suck fresh air as they burned the thing. So, yeah, people took a lot of trouble to do this. So, Hamalvi 2 report should add up a bright Jetido Yellowware cover on it. And I'm hoping it's done by the end of the year. And you can add that to your reading list, too. So anyway, that's homology and homology too. Thank you all for coming. Thank Questions? Uh, the, the team of the three bodies, uh, I think you remember that their heads were turned and that they maybe were alive when they were thrown in there. They are in positions such that it's kind of difficult to tell. They may have been unconscious when they were dropped in, or they may have been very freshly dead. Interestingly, there were no real signs of trauma on the bodies, although the young woman was missing half of one of her legs. That went somewhere else, and we don't know. Um, we see sacrificing of other objects. I talked about the pots with their deliberate impacts on them. Um, we also see effigy vessels like ducks and things. The heads have usually been snapped off and the bodies are put in one deposit and the heads go somewhere else. And the actual animals are treated the same way. We find heads of falcons and ravens and various kinds of things, dogs. But if we find the body part of that same animal, the heads and the bodies are usually not together. They've been separated and treated somewhat differently. So we see it going through all different kinds of material classes. Yeah? Was Hamalavi II formally closed when they left? Did they, can you, could you tell? The big kiva um, that's there and open still in the central plaza is probably one of the final places that anything was done at Homolo V2. And it had one nice kachina pot that has a mark in it, um, tucked in the corner. And it probably had flagstones on the bench and the floor. And all the flagstones are gone. And all the wood from the roof is gone. And that really gets me scratching my head because we're starting to perceive that there's a lot of really big stuff moving around the landscape that we've never really accounted for before. 
some cliff dwellings I worked down in the central part of the state, just north of Lake Roosevelt, there should be hundreds of beams in there, and they're not there. There are a few accounts of maybe Apache coming through and burning a few in campfires, but they're not going to be burning beams like that in their campfires. So where did all the people go when they left the cliff dwellings? There's a big Pueblo down at the base of the hill that once they cut all the beams, if you're having to get the beams from the top of the mountain anyway, you've got a bunch that are already sized and cured. Why not pack them out and take them with you? Multi-Kiva site out here south of the Rock Art Ranch. We've got wonderful preservation of bone and some wood and very clear that they pushed the walls over. They intentionally closed and cleared that. There's no wood anywhere. When those guys moved, they probably took it to Chevron Pueblo. Does that mess with your dating? Oh, yeah. If somebody got a bunch of wood pieces out of Granite Basin Ruin up on Cherry Creek, they'd probably have dates that are anywhere from 40 to 60 years off. And we know from historic accounts that Hopi themselves, modern day, salvage wood out of old kivas and recycle it into new kivas. Or a lot of the big churches and things that got closed after the Pueblo Revolt, those beams got reused and recycled in various places. We know how much wood was dragged off the Chuska Mountains into Chaco Canyon. Hundreds, thousands of beams. So it's not an impossible task. And when we're missing things like flagstones off the benches, it makes me want to ask a Hopi what kind of sandstone floors they've got in their kivas up there at Hopi. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Need to find somebody that's actually been in a kiva. But it's, you know, there are lots of funny things, so. Uh, the kiva with the three buddy bodies, uh, how is it in relation as far as when it was closed with the rest of the... They did not burn that one. They seem to be in the process of remodeling that kiva when it happened because there was a stack of flagstones in one corner, vertical, and the flagstones that were in place had been laid over a bit of a burned roofing material and an earlier floor that had no flagstones on it anymore, but was the surface the first floor was on. So they were in the process of redoing that, and it basically pulled the roof off of it, and then something happened to cause those folks to end up in there, and they abandoned the remodeling process and after they had offed them, they threw some really big sandstone chunks in on top of them and around them and then put this big foot and a half thick clay layer yeah, over the top. Yeah, I that one, the one with the three rabbits. Oh, the three rabbits. Yeah. Um, that was just, it looks like the doorway was sealed and basically nobody went in there after that deposit had been made. And Again, if this thing was only occupied 30 to 40 years, they, they are perpetually doing a lot of remodeling there. And there may be as many as 10 kivas in the central plaza. We only really know accurately about three of them. And it's clear that all those were burned, but they were burned and closed at some point during the course of the occupation of that. And not a bad thing, that's a very, safe thing to do to protect somebody who's not properly informed and initiated from things that could harm them from the power and the things that are in that kiva. So it's a way of protecting the rest of the community from what might be associated with that kiva. They, they sealed it off there. Yeah. Like, huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any signs of disease or plague? Probably not. <coughs> um, and we don't have a really good answer to that because we are purposely not dealing with burial populations that you'd have to really comprehensively do to see if there are problems. 
in parts of the Southwest, there are some nutritional things that show up, particularly in the skull and other bones that have to do with focusing on corn diet too much. You miss certain proteins unless you process it the right way. And it's not gonna kill you, but it takes you out of the prime of health quite a bit. Um, to get an indication of how healthy or unhealthy these populations were, there's a great study um, that was done primarily of Navajo plant use, um, but they're the same plants. And probably 80% of the plants identified were things having to do with stomach ailments. So you get the idea that people, because of the water and because of what they're eating and general sanitation and stuff, probably were not always in the peak of health all the time. But it's stuff that's not going to kill you right away. It'll just, you know, it decrease, decreases or increases childhood mortality, certainly, and affects birth processes and survivability and things like that. But once you get into your five, six, seven age range, unless you fall off the cliff, you're probably going to make it into your 20s. And there were certainly people that made it into their 40s and 60s. But general lifespan was pretty short. Yep. And this person sitting right here in your midst is one of the reasons this park exists. She had a rabble-rousing husband by the name of Lou, who also happened to be a U of A grad, and that always helps. <laughs> See, there are friends in all kinds of places. And Kenny Zhu, who ran the Entree Hotel down there behind the restaurant, gave us a place to live one year as a U of A grad. So it all works together very nicely. <laughs> but these guys were the rabble-rousers that helped get the gov and the folks in the State Historic Preservation Office off Bruce their Babbitt duffs. Bruce time. Babbitt yeah. was the governor. Being a good northern Arizona ranch guy, he wanted to do things for rural, rural northern Arizona and for native peoples, and he certainly heard it from the Hopi that their ancestral areas needed to be protected, and he made it happen that it turned into a park and got us a little bit of funding to get the research program going. So thank you, Rick. There's a lot of people coming together to make that happen.